Uh, welcome these two speakers, um, proactive in this world um, of worm resistance. So it's great having um, Mike McCrary and Andrew Darling here, both from the Wire Wrapper, um, who are confronting worm resistance, which is a huge issue. And we're lucky enough to have um, uh, um, a good turnout. And um, uh, yeah, so you guys all set ready to go. You're good? We're good. Righto. So we'll hand it over to Mike and Andrew. Um, I'm going to disappear and go and find out how long we've got and um, come back to you. So I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Andrew. Um, Mike, so it's getting our technology going here. But an opportunity out of um, change. Uh, pretty inspirational what we've heard so far today. It's going to be pretty hard to follow up with, but um, yeah, it certainly resets your mind. And, um, what we're going to talk about here, hopefully opportunity came out of it. Um, maybe Mike didn't really want the opportunity, but it certainly arrived at his door. So, yeah. So, um, so as breeders and finishers working together to manage triple drench resistance in a land finishing system is what we've called the talk. Uh, but like every cooming of farms, Andrew Dowling with, with Brightsons and also a wormwise facilitator. Um, part of what we've done over three years has involved a number of people who have put up here on the board. Um, yeah, so the local vets out of the wider and Renee, Dave Levick and the Ag Research Parasitology team. Um, but they're a pretty important part of sort of creating some of the science that we're trying to help interpret and put to use on farms. Um, Matthew Parasitology Labs, we'll show you some pictures of some larvae. Cause we can always talk about the shit, but seeing pictures is actually pretty cool. Um, Silver Fern Farms are great because they're part of the system too. We're, um, all our systems, we're going to make something that they can market to sell. And to certainly see worm resistance as something that's going to challenge us there and also to beef and lamb. Just so, a few, Mike. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, this is Kooming at Farm. Um, I'm like, I'll operate So, yeah, we've got the old Rimhunga River, like we're basically 70% of our boundaries surrounded by water. Um, yeah, we have a lot of swan and geese issues, but um, yeah, we've got a pretty unique opportunity to farm such a big area of flat land. Um, so, yeah, we were. Um, Oh, it's a little bit, but the logs and that sign there uh, came out of the ground in Kubinger and we got them carbon dated and they were um, 1066, uh, they even died, so that's how long that land's been forming for. And that's the Lake Warrapa in the background. But yeah, so basically we're just talking about, here. Yeah, 540 uh, hectares effective here, we also lease another 210 hectares. Um, yeah, we sort of, uh, we brought into this farm in uh, 2008. Uh, running a contracting business at the time, thought we were going to be cropping farmers, cropping about 400 hectares a year. A um, couple of glitch, you know, bad years. Um, we pumped 70 thousand dollars a year into drying crops and sort of came a gutsa. Um, uh, met Tom Chisholm, um, Ag Designs uh, got us into GPS calibrating systems, um, so we started sort of on the track of a fairly intensive um, farming model, um, running running all our stock in cells, um, lots of poly wire, uh, it's 14 kilometres of poly wire in every um, cell system. Uh, yeah, so you've got the sort of um, basic cattle system and sheep system uh, on the left there, um, which we do run cattle in our sheep systems as well now. Um, so when we talk about what we, what we did as part of the study, we took two of these systems that were run um, similarly apart from the one change, which was the um, change in the quarantine drenching protocol coming in. So we talk about it, each one of those is like a little farm within the farm. Mike talks about it, it's really simple, and I get it for about two minutes, and then he just loses me. <laughs> they move a lot of wire. Yeah, yeah so they're basically farmers. We've got about uh, 37 identical farmers within our farm, and they all farm their own stock. Um, and yeah, basically when we, when we were intensifying, we were getting up to sort of running 80 lamps to the hectare for three months, coming in through the spring. And it was all going well. Yeah, yeah. 
then that's it. So it's going well with those things too. You put on a spreadsheet, it looked bloody good. But then you start getting some lamb deaths in the autumn, quite a few listless, scourings of weight loss. Well, you know the title of the topic, so you know what's happening. Um, Peak leak out eight days after the triple drench, so it's 700 to 4,500 eggs per gram. Um, and those there, so if, if, anyway, if some of you have never seen a fecal leak out, that's pretty high. But worried there. Um, checked another farm, which is also run as part of the system, and we had eggs in the feces there as well. So what's happening? You don't just get to sit there and look at us. Someone said we've got an issue. <laughs> Give them a prize. <laughs> Expensive one, yeah. Yep, so what's happening? We've got eggs in our fecal samples eight days after drenching. What's that telling me? It tells me you didn't kill the worms. That could be resistant, but that tells me that drenching did not work. So we've got adult worms still alive and well inside those lambs. And that 700 to 4,500 tells me we've got a lot of worms still alive in those lambs. I'd rather the egg count was lower than that when we started. Not bloody afterwards. <laughs> we'll leave a thousand lambs to get through the winter. This is opportunity, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> it didn't seem like it at the time. So what would you suggest that we should have done? Or what, what, what would you do in the situation? So that was a triple drench. Yes. Um, we got someone's here to start it. That's um, right, mate. That's what we did do. So thanks, there. Yep, we gave them a star tech, um, and yeah, might have a game change, wasn't it? Oh, I haven't seen. Yep. It's an amazing what an effective drench could do, and that reminds us why we started drenching in the first place. Because you had stock that weren't doing so well, and we used this great stuff that came out of a drum, and it worked so well, we just kept on using it because shit, it was good. Um, so yeah, and that worked really well. It was amazing how quickly it got on top of. The issue at the time, so yeah, eight weeks after the post, after that, maybe he counts at 300 to 1200 in those lambs. How often did you measure the e count? How often we measure the e count as in, in here? After the start, yeah. Oh, see, we, think we went out at four weeks, six weeks to see what was going on. Because one of the concerns was that we had a massively high larval challenge, and even though we killed the adult worms, it's going to fill back up again. So, yeah, that was it. A lot of sampling done there once we sort of realised what was going on. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, then we think you think it's very clear that not always that clear, it's in muddy waters, so um, we've seen some eggs and some samples after Zolvix. Now, Lanco are a bloody good little company to work with. Their quality assurance means a lot for them when you ring them up and say you've used a Zolvix, and it's like the same for, for um, Zoetis with StarTech. And you've got eggs in it, they'll come and investigate because they want to know why. Because okay, they don't want to have happened to their dredges, what well, they've done to every other one. So Colin Mackay came along, did it. Beauty, it's always a star tech, worked 100% effectively. Why did we get eggs and no samples? Most likely we hadn't dredged them properly. Um, but Matrix and Triple Max were shit. Shit, they were just, we basically, we, we ended up with more eggs after dredging than we had before dredging. Which is not a real result, it just shows it didn't work. Um, but Triple Max appeared to be a lot worse than Matrix. And that worried us because we sell lots and lots of triple max. So we did a bit more investigating and turned out there's no there was no difference in the end. Okay, and we've looked at a few other farms. But it just means if you see something on your farm that's unusual, please tell us. So we can go and find out because lots of other people want to know too. So that was good. Uh, we ended up with a pretty severe teledosagia, that's good old Ostatagia resistance. So 29% of them that were dredging were killed. And on the trikes about 71% efficacy. So it looked like we had um, multiple resistance, yeah, multi-drug resistance and two species of worms. Right. Um, so yeah, so here's how, how we got here. You've got to look back to go forward. So Mike, you talk through a, a cooming, a farming system. Yeah, so basically we started, um, I guess, um, coming out of the cropping thing, we um, started with silk ferns, owned all of our stock. So we're in a fast finishing situation. Um, we're just on uh, weight gain contracts, um, uh, just for capital reasons and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, and it's sort of, uh, especially through the bull program and partially the sheep, um, yeah, there was a competitive, like, um, we got the sheer data all of a sudden and um, we started learning a lot about growing stock. Um, it wasn't a lot of money 
well, we didn't think there was enough money in it at that stage. Um, and so we started sort of intensifying and starting to do longer trades. So instead of buying a 36, 37 kilo lamb and uh, pump them out, sort of eight kilos on them and pump them back out again, um, we started buying lighter and lighter lambs and accepting lower growth rates um, and pushing them further into the winter and doing supposable bigger um, margins. And yeah, we peaked out at 32,000 lambs. Uh, everything looked really good. And um, yeah, we just came into an autumn when we thought it was just autumn mill thrift and we were in big trouble. Yeah, I think you're right in that. When your focus was on live weight gain, you could see that. When the focus was getting animals through the spring, Staying alive was the focus, it wasn't necessarily growing, so these things creep up on you without noticing. How long into your journey was that? When did you reach that point? Uh, <coughs> probably three years out of, um, out of doing the fast finishing, and um, yeah, it wasn't long. Yeah, good to think, yeah. And you went from doing about 9,000 lambs a year to getting 32,000 lambs a year through the farm. Now that's not 32,000 lambs on the farm at any one time, but it was just turning over a lot of lambs and carrying a lot of lambs through the winter. And I personally, I think what Mike went through, a lot of other farmers went through, because suddenly lambs are worth a lot in the spring. So you carry more lambs through the spring. And this is some of the consequence, I think, of what's happened. Yeah. Uh, they, they've been quarantine drenching at Kuminga for years, so we've been doing that, and the, the other drenches, every other drench is a triple, okay? That's how it's sort of, it worked the system. So yeah, where there's some warning lights, Mike. Um, yep, had a few yeah. drench checks there, they were looking a bit odd, but you just go to work with the staff again to make sure we're drenching them properly. Yeah, that was the biggest one, I think, is, is just second guessing what was happening on farm. And, and I think, um, like Andrew was saying before, if you get something that's a little bit off, check it and check it again. Like, don't, like you know, the, the shit sampling and that is cheap. Yeah. And, checking the way people are drenching and bits and pieces. And it's not until you come back and do the, uh, the individual sheet, uh, like a drench check, which is individual sheet, that you actually pick up the missed drenching, because that can really skew your results. How many of you go down to a short drench interval in the autumn? Because you need to keep on top of the worms. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did it, and it didn't work. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a sign to me that the system's failing. But you had, to go, you had to go down to 21 days because either stock were losing weight or they're dying. Okay? So, yeah, that was that. Um, but, yeah, when you're in the middle of things, it's all going flat out. You just go and like That worked in the first year and blew us to bits in the second. Yeah. Like, if we did it again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a good point, Mike. It, um, you change something and it works, so you think the system, the thing everything's solved. It's not. It's just that band aid worked really, really well. Um, lamb growth rates weren't really an issue, uh, weren't the target, sorry, so they weren't seen as, as an issue. Yeah, we accepted lower lamb um, growth rates because we were pushing through to the winter, and, and basically out of it, we got massive growth rates in the first and second years, like sort of up to 500 grams, um, but just for a small window, and then um, sort of, I guess we got a little bit of compensatory growth out of them when we put them up. But, yeah. And did you say that, the wheels flew off? Like it didn't really look like it was going wrong, it just went wrong. Uh, it went really wrong, and we actually had 22,000 lambs on this. Yeah. Yeah. We were in big trouble. So, to say that, yep, yeah, hindsight's a dangerous thing, but yeah, if you look back at it, yes, there were some warning signs there. Um, did we heed them at the time? Obviously, not, hard, no, not well enough, but yes. But don't let hindsight, you don't look back too much and try and pick holes in what you did wrong. That's what you're going to do to go going forward. Because it happened in that autumn period, it probably took our eye off the ball a bit. We just accepted, you know, accepted that we were entering a, a hot period. And, um, yeah. So then um, you got a farming system that's finishing bulls and finishing lambs. You've now diagnosed a triple drench resistance. Um, this is pretty serious. So what's going to happen? There's good uh, two studies out of New Zealand showing production losses from using ineffective drenches over a period. Uh, one's on 14% loss in the carcass value of pretty much of every lamb that's on the property for more than four months. That's a lot of income. That's gone. So you either feed those lambs more grass to get them to the weights you want, or you accept to get less money for them. But either way, it costs money. That's, um, that's pretty big. Can we even keep on finishing lambs here? 
That's a big one for me. Fixing a drug addiction with a different drug doesn't work. You know, it's a, it's a shot across the bowels that the system was failing, and we had to change the system. And that's big. That's a huge thing to change the system. You know, it's not something you just do overnight. And when you do change it, it's not always, it doesn't always work right either. Um, run more cattle, that's cool, but if we just go to young cattle, we might just switch one drug addiction in a species to another one. So you have to not repeat the past. Um, unfortunately, this farm doesn't suit running a new flock. Okay, so that was something we looked at, and it's um, the Paris Torrance has been in there, and obviously you've got to get some animals that can give you a good source of refugia. It's just too exposed to run ewes there over lambing, so you have to think of other ways and other opportunities. And Mike was taking lambs from a lot of breeders. If he can't finish the lambs, who's going to buy them? If he can't fatten the lambs, who's going to, you know, where the meat can get the lambs from too? So it's great having silver fern farms involved in this project. So, um, change, so look at changing the system. One of the big ones was fewer lamb days on grass. Which I think is saying to say. We put it, yeah, we had some crop to, to migrate them off um, and to drop our numbers basically through the autumn. Yeah. We dropped back from 10 to be there um, and load crops up yeah. to break, break yeah. those um, grass day numbers. Yeah. yeah. So, so we've got a system here, we've got drench resistance, we've also got this drench oh, overwhelm with larval challenges. Those drench resistant worms are only an issue if you need to kill them and you can't. So we need to reduce the number of worms. If any of you have been to a Wormwise workshop or read the Wormwise book, you would have seen this graph. What it's basically showing is along the bottom of a number of weeks, two, four, six, out 14 weeks, and up the, going up is the weight gain in these lambs over that period. And these lambs are running four different scenarios to try and show what is the impact of eating more larvae on the pasture every day. So, looked at here, but the group that grew the slowest over the 14 weeks, they put on about 7 kilos, they ate 5,000 larvae a day. Okay? Now, you might say, what's 5,000 larvae a day? It's just 5 times more than 1,000. It's just looking at it relatively, okay? Don't get too up with the numbers, it's the rankings of where these sit. Um, but then, shit, if I go and drench these lambs, it'll help a lot too. So the next group, they ate 5,000 larvae a day, and they'll drench every, th every 3 weeks. Yeah, every three weeks they've got to drench. So on a high larval challenge with drenching, yes, they did better. And if you're doing this on your farm, you'd see an improvement because you've just done the same thing to every lamb, they will improve. But if you can get it down that they only had 1,000 larvae a day, they're going to grow significantly more quickly than the other two groups. And if we had the panacea and they had no worms at all, that is how fast they'll grow. So the fewer larvae you can get your lambs or your calves to eat every day, the faster they'll grow. This is just showing the energy cost, the loss of production that those animals are having by having to fight with those parasites and the impact that parasites are having on them. So, number one rule, the fewer parasites you eat, the faster you grow. Um, changing the system, this took, a, this took a bit more thought. So you try and also uh, decrease the uh, drenches per lamb and start using knockout drenches during the season. So how many of you have you heard of the knockout drench theory? You don't want to yell out sort of what we're trying to achieve with it? You're going to be brave. It's just get rid of those resistant worms. You get rid of any resistant worms or in your animal during the season so they stop growing. Yep. Another good thing is about it, it costs a lot that knockout drench, doesn't it? When you get drenching, you start using lots and lots of knockout drench. <laughs> Suddenly the giveaways in your drench still don't matter because it goes through the roof. But yeah, the knockout drench. Um, so the studies have been done both in field studies and with computer modelling, showing that if you use a drug that's got a different active to your normal drench during the season, you can extend the life of your normal drench. Because the, the active that's different in that drug will kill the worms that your, your normal drench is not, not, um, not killing. So, and it's, once again, it's just, just relatively to use. If this system, system here, if the resistant was as a recessive gene, because it could also be, uh, sorry, dominant. Time to drench failure. These aren't years, they're computer model cycles, okay, but they are still relative. So that's about twice as long as that. Um, daily death rate of the larvae along here, if it's 5% a day, it would take this long to become resistant if you never use a knockout drench. If you use it once in a season, you extend it a bit. 
a bit more if you use it as a third, and a lot longer if you use it as a fifth drench. Okay? So this is stuff we know. We know this stuff, and this is something we should all be doing on our farms every year, and both our intensively drenched lamb and cattle systems. Is using these knockout drenches to help extend the life of your, of your drug. Okay? So when you take homes, if you're doing nothing different today, you start doing this if you're not, not doing it already. So yeah, use a knockout drench. That was one. More cattle into the system. How do you manage that, Mike? Yeah, so we've gone to um, cattle sheep rotations um, because we're uh, sort of calibrated. So basically the lambs are on the 64 day round and the cattle are on the 64 day round but they're in the same lot so they're only 32 days apart. So there's basically two productive systems in the one system. Um, and that has helped us lower Yeah, so that, that basically lowered, helped us lower our, our worm numbers so then to help us with um, introducing uh, refugia. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so using the cattle system, they're saying in, in there, as much as possible, um, the cattle and lambs are grazed together. And that, something we tried to do, but you, you did it one year and you found the lambs grew faster and the technos that had cattle in with them than, than on their own. Massive difference. So most of our farm is run by that now. Can I ask what age are the cattle? Uh, the mix actually, there's calves and there's two year olds. Uh, bulls, all bulls. Yep. Um, the calves are only just a new one this year. And um, we actually ran into a few problems and we ended up making some of our blocks too hot for the calves because we were waiting for a lot of the calves came in a lot earlier into the system. And um, yeah, we didn't get lambs in. So the, um, the, with cattle and kumenga, it's been wet in the winter, can't take too many big cattle through the winter. So you're trying to get as many out before the second winter. So that'll be the restriction with them. So, um, right, yeah, we wanted to see, could we um, introduce and maintain a population of worms in refugia? Um, so these are worms that are not being selected by the drench. So they've got to keep their nice drench sensitive genetics and spread them around the population. Another thing was what drenches do we use if we need to kill the worms first. And this is sort of a bit of new territory. We've never really done this before. We haven't really done this before. So to see what was going on. So Andrew? Yes. Did you um, do anything, you modified the um, ratio of cattle and the time they spent on the paddock. Did you modify the grazing height and the residuals at all? We're, <coughs> we're just starting to play with that now. Um, uh, just looking at the NDF, see if we can get our um, NDFs down lower for the lambs, sort of under 35s. We are, that's, that's our next phase, to try and get the lambs growing faster again. So that the focus is to grow the lambs as fast as possible and if anything hold the bulls back a bit. Which sounds stupid, but not, you're not so focused at that stage on the on the bull growth rates. So they sort of do the cleaning up and the lambs come after them getting the best feed. Yeah, the negative we're playing with, with that is um, the stocking rate of the bulls. If they're on 40 day old grass, the, our stocking rate needs to be higher. Thanks. Right, so we won't go about the graphic on how to get drench resistance. So we try to introduce some susceptible worms into Kuminga. Um, so Renee Holt from Inside New Zealand helped us with this, get some funding between Silverfin Farm, Beef and Lamb, he uses some Action Network Group funding. Um, and the thing is, are we trying to win or get better? And I think if you're trying to focus on beating the worms, you're going to be disappointed. I think we've got to focus on getting better than where we are and just trying to get a little bit better every day. Okay, it's just, yeah, we Let's not try and ask for too much. We took a long time to create these resistant worms. We're not going to suddenly get rid of them. Okay? And we did create them. Um, so we've got the farmers together. You know, the more drench susceptible the worms are on your breeding farm, the better. Um, but also how you're preparing those lambs to go to the finishing farm has a massive impact on their performance as well. So um, your farm between the farms, how they're managed through weaning, whether you can uh, wean them in blocks rather than doing it all, all at once. 
Uh, there's a, quite a bit of impact on how those lambs grow. Um, other diseases like pneumonia yeah, has, a, has a huge impact. So it's trying to uh, manage that. But trying to yeah, work with the farmers, not just about the worms, but doing things that can help them spend less time on Mike's farm. Because that's gonna, the, the, low, the shorter the time on the farm, the less chance they have of getting another drench. So we worked with their vets, did dredge efficacy tests, and then got them in and all talked to them about the results and what they could do with them. Got Dave Leverick in, because if you don't, you're naughty. <laughs> <laughs> you, you better have Dave on your side. <laughs> and he, bloody, he knows a hell of a lot. <laughs> did some worm-wise workshops, they were really good. And even if your worms are all dredge susceptible, there are still things that you can change in your farming system that will help keep it that way. So yeah, breeders are a huge part of the solution. So this is what we did. It ran the two farmlets. So the farmlet and one of them, we tried to get the refugia. In the first year, we left 20%. So we took some farms that we, we knew had really drenched susceptible worms on them. Okay, so we put lambs in those farms that had never been drenched, brought them in and had 20% of the lambs into the block in January, February, and March were undrenched. So if 100 lambs went out of the techno, the 100 that came in, 80 got drenched and 20 didn't. We did that through that period. Um, other 80% were quarantine drenched. We speakily counted, monitored to see when to re-drench. From April onwards, we just drenched everything. But worried about just loading the place up too much with worms. And by that stage, the, the lambs on these farms had, had a number of drenches anyway, so I wasn't confident that they actually were full of susceptible worms anymore. They would have, more, they'd have resistant ones in there too. Years two and three, we, went down to, we took that number from 20% down to 5%. Because you'll see we made it a bit wormy. Yeah, it's just getting a bit wormy. Yeah. The other block run the same apart from quarantine drenching. So if cattle came into this system, they went into that system. Cattle went out, they went out. Mirrored it as much as possible apart from that quarantine drenching was the only difference. So what do we end up with? Um, if you look down here, so the refugia group, in January the fecal count was 640, in February it was 1380, that's out of the whole group in there. Um, but what we did do was, yeah, we made it pretty wormy. So in July, this is the normal farmlet, it had an ear count of 304, and the refugia had 720. So we certainly had produced, brought in quite a few worms, but we didn't actually bring in the worms we really wanted. We brought in a lot of barbers pole worms, which wasn't very clever <laughs> in hindsight. So just bringing in undrenched lambs isn't the answer. So we changed farms that we brought the, the worms in from. The one that um, has got very susceptible worms too, but didn't have near the barber's pole. Um, because I say it's, yeah, so then barber's pole lower there. So, yes? So how did you establish that, Andrew? Did you do larval cultures before the lambs came in off the breeding farm? Um, yes, we did, yeah. yeah. So, we did the larval so cultures, but of course, yeah. the lambs are on the farm by the time you get the larval culture result in, because it takes a couple of weeks <laughs> and things change. But it gave us a good idea, yeah. Yeah, it did, Jenny. Um, do you want to know what these little larvae are? This is what they are. These are the things that your, um, your calves and your lambs eat when they're on pasture. You stick a bit of iodine on them and it kills them. Okay, and then to identify them. So when you do a larval culture, this is what the person at the lab is looking at. And they identify them, because I'm trying to tell you, none of the stuff's 100%. You've either got long tail worms, because they've got a long tail. That's either Nemodorus, Esophagostomy, or Shibertia. And the good people can tell you that by how fat they are and stuff that I can't do. We've got medium tail worms, so that's a medium tail. And that's either a cuperia or a homonchus. And then we've got short tails, that's, just, that's um, Telorosalia, or off the target, and trikes. And you pick them by their length. But then it gets a bit, bit hard because a resistant Telorosalia is shorter than a normal one. And they can be quite similar to a trike. So you can't always be sure if it's a trike or a Telorosalia. Okay, so these things are not 100%. You've got to keep that in mind. But that's when you look at the larvae, that's, that's what they look at. So, did it work? End of the day, we've done a reduction test now. On the normal farmlet, this is the worm species we had on. Did this in June. We did the exact to wait till we got worm counts high enough. Had a lot of Nemodorus worms in there as well, which is interesting. Looked at the results. Well, we used to have quite a telodosagia resistance. Well, doing nothing fixed that. Take that as a win. That's good. But, um, that's a bit shit. There's zero. It, was, it was negative, but you can't put negative up there. So that, that wasn't very good. Um, yeah, that's, that's not working. Um, in the refugia block, let's see if we did anything. We had some impact. So, oops, 
we go back along there the tail massage here it's not as good as in the the normal block but it's an improvement now don't think that 80 percent and 60 percent are different numbers are quite likely the same don't these aren't absolute numbers it's not that accurate but on the trike is stronger this 90 percent is shit way better than zero that's a lot better so to put them up and put them next to each other between the, the normal group Okay, so the Telrosagia is at 99% compared to 63 for the Refugia group. Okay, maybe it's, something's happening there. But on the trikes, gone from 0% up there in the, um, in the normal farmlet to 90% on the, in the Refugia one. So I think we certainly have had an impact there. So what have we achieved? We'll go through. Lower the, the worm challenge on the farm. Yep, that was a win and that had to happen. I think that's almost more important than trying to beat the resistance. We need to re reduce that to keep lambs growing. Yeah, I think that's, that's one of the faster ways to go. Like if you get lower, then you don't have to bring in so much refugia and, um, and you know, basically uh, the, the performance of those refugia stock is quite low. Yeah. It's a, yeah it's a, so if you've got a really high la larval challenge in a pasture, you need a lot more worms to try and dilute that out. Yes, and lowering the first is great. Um, the tail massage efficacy improved on both blocks, but not as good in the refugia. It was sort of a win, but like Ginny said, here's don't let perfection get in the way of improvement. Still take it as a win, that's all right. And the tail is the trike of strongest is greatly improved, so yeah, I think that's that is a, a bloody win there. That's good. Well, that's a big one for us, isn't it? The win, though. Yeah, yeah. So it's easy, just everyone buy an undrenched land with three, no resistance and you win. No, it's not, because <laughs> you might end up with a whole lot of barbers, whole worm. You don't want that. In my experience, those lambs grow slower. And now I've talked to other researchers, they we had them growing 20, 20 to 50% slower than the drenched lambs. Okay, but they, they didn't see that same impact, but it does happen. You've got to have the right worms. We're going to drown in barber's pole. Um, yeah, and, and then once they start being drenched on the farm, they, they aren't only having susceptible worms in them. So buying lambs in February of a farm with a good drench resistant status and that lambs have three drenches, it's going to have some resistant worms in it. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, and if you don't know your drench efficacy, you could be absolutely wasting your time. So until you know what's going on in your farm, trying to beat something you don't even know where you're standing, may not be any good. And you still gotta maintain those worms in that refugia. So no, it's not as simple as just leaving them undrenched. Um, yeah, the drench plan we had, we basically came in with a, with a quarantine and then we would do a triple and then do a, a Drench check to see if we could go again, but I won't cover that because we're running out of time. Yeah. And, but we swapped by, yeah, we swapped. Um, so oh, one, one spring we're using Zolvix, the next <coughs> spring we use Stardew. Yeah. And we keep swapping. Yeah, true. Yeah, good point. Is that, and if you use the Zolvix as your quarantine, you start to get your knockout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah we do that. Yes, yeah. And each year, each year change it. Which has been so hard this year, even harder this year because we're running out of the drenches. Which is a bit of a lie. So at the moment, this is what creaming so looks like from what Mike told me. I hope it's still similar. <laughs> That's in there. Um, so yeah, so it's now separated bulls and lambs because of um, soil and plant conservation, radio. And they won't really be back together again until October, which gives us an opportunity because there's also going to be some blocks in there that have had almost nothing but cattle in them for the next sort of six months. Okay, <laughs> just think of that. Um, but then what are we going to do in the future? What's the ideal delay between that bull and lamb grazing? I don't know, this has to be interesting. Trying to make the, low, the most of the low sheep worm challenge. Now, also doing that, you've got to reduce your drenching. If you reduce your worm challenge on your farm, you've got to reduce your drenching because you've effectively also reduced your refugia. So we need to do some more monitoring too to find out when we should be drenching these lambs. If it takes them 60 days to go around a block that's basically got very few worms in it, we should be able to get, not have to drench those lambs for 60 days. But let's, let's do that. Um, yeah, still short on refugia, it still worries me. And maybe leave 5% of the lambs undrenched each time so they get their normal drench. There's another, there's another option, but that's there. So no. And the cattle, let's not forget about them. We don't end up where we were with the sheep. So, there's our results, thank you. Um, any questions and where should we go from here? Right, well, what's next? Andrew, are there any crops going to be used or 
like, are there any props going to be used? Not, that's not my mind. Uh, like, um, rescue props? Or, 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 or barley props? Or something that breaks the ground? Yeah, um, it's just, like, yeah, the cropping thing, see, see those things here? Really hard to crop through them. We just, we don't earn the money we do with the stock. And I know what you're saying about breaking the ground, but then the potential, when you've got, say, 20 or 30 hectares out of 500 or 700, they become blocks you've really got to manage and make sure that people are not putting the wrong stock, not putting drench stock in there. Like that the refuse chain and drain is really, really happening because they can get out of control so quick. And that's what happened. We regrassed the farm for three years and it just blew our wheels off. But that's a good point because certainly on farms using um, summer autumn crops can be a good way of getting lambs off pasture so they're not dumping their parasites on the pasture. So I think a lot of farm systems that would work. So like we don't have one paddock out of a rotation. Every every paddock is a all has its own stock, own everything. Like we don't take one cell out of a block, and it just um, yeah. But what so so what I'm saying is it might challenge your techno system. They might. Oh yeah, 100. Yeah, I'm looking at yeah, the big picture. Big, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just yeah. For me, um, controlling those guys on the bikes, you know when we start putting our um, whole technos in at new grass stage, you've really got to drum into them what happens in those blocks. Um, I mean, I'm very, very sensitive because we've been through an absolute shithole. And um, the drench, 44,000 lambs in 12 days. <laughs> Any other questions? What thoughts, what you do? If I was a breeder, I'd be wondering who's going to buy all your store lambs because I'm the same as Mike, I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name's Roger Darrell, and we do exactly what Mike does, and we're not buying lambs in November through to January, February either. So all the breeders in here should be asking, what are we going to do, because how are we going to support finishers? Are they going to pay a premium for Yes, I will pay a premium for the right lambs. Yeah. Same. But we need to know your... Yeah your status yeah. and proper proper status too like a yeah really why are they still why are they still selling lambs and doing sales yeah. so why yeah. are finishers still buying them then and still making I don't buy anything out of the sale yard yeah. so the question is why are lambs still bought and sold out of the out of the, um, out of the sale yards oh, you can still quarantine drench your let those lambs and kill those triple resistant worms you can do it we know the technology, we do have the technology about to do these things, we're going to do the basics. So if you're buying them even out of anyone, I think Zolbitzing or star taking as part of your quarantine drench is a no-brainer. Anything else that doesn't contain Zolbitz or star tech is not a quarantine drench. It's not. Call it anything you like, it's not a quarantine drench. We've got to do that. Yeah, right? Yeah, so the question about Zolbus and Startex and resistance, how many times have, mo have you people used either Zolbus or Startex on your farms? Because I know how much we sell and it's sold all. So yes, in time, Renee, it'll be a problem, but I think for most people, just do the basics and use it. And, it do, and, I think, and even with that, do your drench checking just to make sure it's worked. But for most of, it, most of you farmers, we need you to use those drenches and knock out drench at least in as a quarantine drench so we don't end up in this situation.